It is always a privilege to have uh, come and share with us uh, evangelist Ken Cowan, who has done a lot of things in a lot of different areas of ministry for a few years, but he travels the country and he preaches, and he preaches a word of faith directly from the Word of God. He will pump up your faith level today, so if you need a new diamond ring right after church, ask God for it, and you'll be ready to get it. Now, he does bring a great message of faith, and you're going you're gonna to thoroughly enjoy him. If you've never met Ken Cowan and his lovely wife, and uh, let's give them a big hand as Ken comes to share the Word. Yeah. He shocked me. Praise the Lord. Am I on? Glory to God. Well, are you saying amen or oh me today? You do know that uh, your results will be determined by what you're saying and the attitude you have, right? You know, a lot of people, they tell me I preach uh, positive thinking and they've got me. I do. Because I'd rather think positively than think negatively. Amen? Amen. But I'd much rather think positively according to the Word of God. This is what I try to get people to see is if you'll think according to the Word of God, then you'll start speaking according to the Word of God. And then the Word of God will begin to manifest and become visible in your life. Amen? Whatever area. You know, the Word of God is a seed. And wherever you sow it, it will bring a harvest. Amen? Amen? And a lot of people think, well, since I'm saved, everything else will take care of itself. Well, you know, it's good to be saved. It's wonderful to be saved. But know this, there's a whole lot more to it after you get saved. You know, I, I, I encourage people to get all you can and can all you get. <laughs> Amen. And so, uh, you know, there's so many things that are available to us because we are saved. And so it's a shame that we would be saved and walk as a child of God and then not enjoy the goodness of our father. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, it, and, 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 you know, our father, he wants to be good to us and we don't have to talk him into it. Yeah. You see, so many Christians spend more time trying to talk God into doing things instead of just receiving what God has already readily made available to you. Amen. That's why he says for us to come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, so many Christians, they do not, have to, they do not know how to approach God in, in a bold way. Amen? Because they think that's arrogant. They think all different kinds of things. But if the Bible says for us to come boldly, then let's do that. Now, it's not arrogant, but when you come boldly, that means you come knowing you're going to be received heard and knowing that your petitions are going to be answered. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I talk to people, you know, I've learned some things in ministry over the last 30 years that if you'll just listen to people, talk to people, listen to them, they'll tell you what you need to preach about. Well, let me try that on this side. If, you, if you'll just listen to people and talk to them, they'll tell you what, the, what you need to preach about. See, I don't have to search for sermons. People give them to me. Amen? And so because people, what, what does the Bible say? You're taught well here. Out of the abundance of the heart, what happens? The mouth speaks. So whatever is in greater quantity in your mind, whatever your thoughts are, that's what's eventually going to come out of your mouth. Amen? Your concerns will come out of your mouth. Amen? You're either your concerns or your confidence will come out of your mouth. Amen? And so uh, I want to talk to you. I've got about four sermons that I've, I've, I've labored all week and, and I still just haven't got settled on any of the four. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to combine them all. Is that all right? Hallelujah. I know that scared some of you. You said, oh my God, he's going to preach four sermons today. Well, if, you, if, if I preach too long, you go ahead. I'll finish it. The last time I did it, I got myself saved. Amen? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> we always look forward to coming to New Life Church. Uh, we've been coming here now for seven or eight years. And uh, the friendship that has blossomed between uh, Pastor and, and, uh, and Sister Lori and Connie and myself has really been one that we have thoroughly enjoyed. It's been a blessing to Connie and I. It's always good to talk to them, spend time with them. And... Uh, 
I, I, I tell him all the time, you do know that this church is the best kept secret in Columbia. <clears throat> Amen? It is the best kept secret in Columbia. You know, uh, if, if there is any first time visitors here, let me, let me warn you. Don't let this uh, influence the decision on whether or not you come back next Sunday. <laughs> you, you come back next Sunday, you'll hear a good preacher, all right? Praise God. But we love Pastor and, and Sister Lori, and we love their family, and we love you. And we, we, we have a soft spot in our heart for New Life Church, and we've come here to uh, encourage you. I, I have people ask me all the time, pastors, I go to conferences, and that's how we have to do. And I go to conferences and pastors say, well, tell me something about your ministry. And I say, here's what I tell them. I say, pastor, I take the word of God and I encourage people with the word of God to live the God kind of life. The God quality of life. That's what, that's what I do. Amen. In other words, there's a quality of life that's available to every born again believer. And it's the same quality life that God lives well, I got a holy hush. Let me go see. <clears throat> Let me go over here and see what this side thinks about that. There is a quality of life that is the God quality of life that he has made available to you. Amen. Woo! Now, <clears throat> here's what I know you're thinking. Who does he think he is telling me that I can live like God? Well, I didn't say we were God. I didn't say, I didn't put us up on the level with God. But let me share this with you. He put me up beside him and seated me there. Yes, he did. Amen. So I might as well go in and act like that. Because if he cared enough about us to raise us up together and seat us at the right hand of the Father right there with Jesus, then evidently we're pretty special. Well, let me go try that on this side because... It's hard to get people to believe that they're special because most people have a very poor uh, attitude toward themselves. They'll love you but hate their self, right? They'll compliment you but they'll tear their self down, right? And it's amazing that God cared enough about you that he sent Jesus to die for you. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I mean, that makes us kind of special, doesn't it? Yes. I, I mean, I didn't do anything to get him to do that. He just got up one day and said, you know, I think I'm going to do this. <laughs> and he did it, right? Let me show you something. Uh, go to Romans 5, and, uh, uh, and while you go there, let me pray. Heavenly Father, I desperately need your help today, because if you don't help me, nobody here will be helped. This will be a failure. But Father, if you'll help me, somebody here will be encouraged, someone will be edified, and someone will be exhorted. So I thank you, Lord, for your help, and I believe that you're going to take care of your precious people here today. Amen. Look with me in 5.14, where uh, Paul said this to the Roman people. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Did you see that? In other words, why, did God, why was God not mad at us? Because we didn't do what Adam did. Well, well there's a quiet one right there. Amen? I know you're thinking. We didn't do what Adam did. And God is a perfect father. He never whips the wrong kids. Amen? What does, a, what does a good father, good mother do? When something happens at the house, we start investigating. <laughs> right? We get all the evidence. And we find out what happened and we find out who did it. Because ain't nobody going to rat nobody out. <laughs> so the parents got to find out, right? But we don't discipline the wrong kid. Well, if God's a better parent than we are, he definitely will not discipline the wrong kids. So why did God get us out of this mess? Because he didn't do what Adam did. Amen? And so he made a way for us to get out of what happened to us because of Adam. In other words, 
God could not just start all over. He would have had to destroy everything he created. He would have had to start all over again, create a new heaven, a new earth, and start all over again. He didn't do that. Let me share this with you. Jesus was not plan B. He was plan A. Glory to God. You missed a chance to shout right there. Amen. In other words, that's why we say this about Jesus. He was the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the earth, of the world, of the earth, right? In other words, he was already slain in God's eyes for the sin that Adam did that fell on us who didn't do it. Amen. Amen. And see, this is why many people say right now, you know, you hear them say, well, God's pouring his wrath out on America. All these bad things that are happening here, it's God's wrath. Well, let me share this with you. Have you ever, you don't want to see God's wrath. You ain't never seen God's wrath, amen? Well, let's just talk about the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. They saw it, amen? Amen. None of them lived to tell about it except the righteous ones in the city. Did you notice he did not pour his wrath out on the righteous ones? And actually, if you read that story, he went in there with angels, took them by the hand, and drug them out. Amen? In other words, God said, well, what did Abraham tell him? You're not going to slay the good with the wicked, are you? He said, that wouldn't be right if you did that, Lord. You're a just God. You won't kill the good with the bad. There's a lot of people that believe that we're seeing God's wrath, God's judgment. You don't want to see God's judgment. Amen. Colonel Sanders didn't come up with extra crispy. God did. (laughs) Colonel Sanders borrowed the idea and got rich off of it. (laughs) Amen? You don't want to see God's judgment. But let me tell you why we're seeing the things in America that we're seeing. It's not because God's pouring his wrath out. It's that the, the people of America have turned their back on God and they've moved out from under his protection. And when you move out from under his protection, then who are you a candidate to receive from? The enemy that's looking for you. So everything you're seeing is happening because of Satan being able to do things that he could not do previously because the people of America were not doing the things that they're doing. And so Satan has been given more influence And these are the things that happen when Satan has influence. That's why the Bible says, all right, uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, How many people know the Holy Ghost is a genius? Well, if you'll learn to listen to him, he'll make you look smart. (laughs) Look over here in Ephesians with me, if you would. And let's look in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. I think that's where it is, if my memory serves me correct. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And let's look in the 27th verse. Neither give place to the devil. Did you see that? Notice this is not optional. Amen? Notice this is Paul speaking to the saints, the children of God in Ephesus, saying this. Do not give the devil a place in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. So what we've done is we've given Satan a place in America now. And you give that dude an inch, he'll take a mile. Amen? Amen? What does the Bible say about leaven? A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. So if you let Satan get in, he'll spread. Amen? He'll affect your economy. He'll affect your health. He'll affect your marriage. He'll affect your children. How many people know that Satan would love nothing better than to kill your kids? 
Because every kid he can kill is one less Christian he has to deal with. You see, he's looking at it from long term. If I can get them when they're young, they'll never get old. Amen? Hallelujah. Y'all just quiet or y'all thinking? (laughs) Neither give place to the devil. That means that we got to get up every day. The first thing we got to do is we got to plug up every hole in our life. Because the devil's just looking for an opportunity. We just moved into another house, a new house. My mom just moved in with us. My dad went home to be with the Lord in February. And my mom decided she wanted to live with us. So we're living, we've always been town dogs. You know the difference between a town dog and a country dog, don't you? You can count the ribs on a country dog. (laughs) Town dogs are fat. Well, we've always been town dogs. Well, we've moved out into semi-country. But we learned something about the country. We've got, we have got uh, visitors now. Mice. Yeah. Amen. And so my wife is not happy about this. Right. And so she is doing everything in the world to plug up every hole that a mouse can get in. Right. And here's what she told me. Neither give place to mice. Amen? And so what we're doing is we're plugging up, we're, we're, we're spraying that stuff that expands. Every hole we can find, we're, we're putting it in. Why? We're trying to keep the mice out. Let me tell you something. You better get up every day and start spraying something in every hole, crack, crevice you got in your life. Because if you don't, he'll get in. And when he gets in, it ain't good. Amen? And so... What we have to do is we have to make sure that we block every attempt. Turn with me, if you would, and we'll just let the Holy Ghost lead. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew, the 12th chapter. Matthew, the 12th chapter. Yes, sir, I'll do that. Hallelujah. Like I said, I'm learning to listen to the Holy Ghost. Hold your place there in Matthew 12 and go over with me to the, uh, James, the book of James, and let me, let me show you this one. The book of James. Hallelujah. Say this with me. God is good all the time. If he's going to be good to anybody, he's going to be good to me. (laughs) You got to talk yourself into that. Amen. Yeah, but I hollered at my hog and my dog and my frog. Well, it'd be better if you didn't do that. But that didn't change God's love for you. Amen. Watch this. Look right here in the seventh verse of the fourth chapter of James. Now, I want to preface this by saying this. My father was my mentor. He was my pastor. And he trained me. And uh, he, I spent many hours with him uh, uh, training for the ministry. Here's what my dad told me. He said, Ken, you'll never effectively preach God's word without putting responsibility in the lap of the hearer. Well, let me go say that on this side over here. He said, you'll never effectively preach the word of God without putting responsibility in the lap of the hearer. Amen. Can I just kill a sacred cow? God, there's a doctrine in the world today saying God's in control. And I'd say if I polled everybody here, there's some here that probably feel that same way. Well, let me share this with you. He is in control, but he doesn't do it like you may think he will. If you're sitting at home on the couch waiting for him to do something, that's not how he controls. Amen? Amen? I mean, we're just, you know, when you hear somebody say things like, well, I've got cancer, but God's in control. Well, if he was truly in control, you shouldn't have cancer. And if he is in control and you got cancer, you need to quit trying to get over it. You need to quit going to the doctor. Because if he's in control, you got cancer, that's what he wants for you. Come on, 
Don't y'all look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> it's amazing. God's in control. Well, if he's in control, then you got cancer. You just need to say, well, Lord, I'll take it. <laughs> Amen? Right. And if God's in control and you can't pay your bills, then why are you working if he's in control and you can't pay your bills, then he don't want you to pay your bills. Is this the new gospel? See, I'm confusing you, right? Well, think about it. Think about it. I have people come to me all the time want me to lay my hands on them. I say, what's wrong? They'll say, well, I've got rheumatoid arthritis, but you know God's in control. I say, well, if he's in control, then you shouldn't have rheumatoid arthritis. Right? What does the Bible say? The thief comes but for to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So if you got cancer, God can't be in control. Well, well. The blood's running deep, isn't it? Them sacred cows, they bleed, don't they? Watch this. I'm going to get you back right. I'm gonna get, watch this. Look over with me in James 4. Notice what this says. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, notice what we're to do. We're to submit ourselves to God. God will control he can control, but the only way he can control in your life is for you to allow him to control. The only thing God can do for you is what you allow him to do. Why would he say, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man or woman will open that door, then I will come in and I will sup with him. Yeah. Notice this. He will not just come in and knock your door out then because that's what a thief does. Yeah. Amen? God's never been a thief. But all he's wanting you to do is you open the door and when you do, glory to God, I'm going to come in. I'm going to take control. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And I'll control to the level of your faith and the knowledge of the word that you have. Watch this. Let's go on a little bit. It says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Notice this. Did you say that when you submit to God, there's a little bit of, there's a, you know, people say, well, what does that mean? Here's what that means. It means that you turn your eyes completely to God. You get your eyes off what the doctor said. You get your eyes off what your banker says. You get your eyes off what the stock market says. And you turn your eyes to what the Word of God said. You submit yourself to God. Yes. Amen. Amen. You cannot resist the devil until you have submitted yourself to God. And then it says this, then you must resist him. Amen? That means you stand fast in your belief, in your faith, you camp out on the Word of God that applies to your situation. And you tell the devil, you will not steal, kill, or destroy me because I believe what the Word says. Amen? And then here's what you have to do. Because he's a little bit on the, he has short-term memory loss. And then you just have to say, and let me tell you what the Word says about that. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Right. Right. While I'm getting back over here, let me, I'm just, 
these are coming. Let me just go along. You remember when Jesus was in the wilderness and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights and it says, afterward he was hungry. And he said, and then the devil came to him and said, if you be the son of God, command these stones that they be made bread, right? right. Well, Jesus didn't sit there, flap his suspenders and say, you're right, I am the son of God. <laughs> and don't you forget it. He didn't say that, did he? He said, Satan, it is written. Well, let me share this with you. If he's the author and the finisher of our faith, how are we to approach Satan? Satan, it is written. Right? Now, let me talk to you about that just for a moment. The Bible says that Satan talked, then Jesus talked. Right? Then Satan talked again. And Jesus talked again. And then Satan talked the third time. And then Jesus talked the third time. And then Satan left. Did you hear what I just said? In other words, you might have to talk to him three times. I have people talk to me. I say, well, well, I really don't want to talk that much. I said, well, honey, let me ask you this. How many times did you tell your kids to clean up the room before that room got cleaned up? Well, right? Well, yeah. What did you do? You kept talking till the room got cleaned up. Well, it ain't no difference with Satan. You keep talking till the room gets cleaned up. Glory to God. Right. Amen. You keep talking till your mountain is moved, amen. You keep talking till the disease leaves. You keep talking till the poverty leaves, amen. But every time you look up, you say, for it is written. Guess what happens when that goes on? God moves in and takes control. Well, Brother Ken, that sounds like work. Well, there is a little work to it, honey. There's a little effort to it. But I got a question for you. You want to be defeated or you want to be successful? You want to be prosperous or you want to be poor? You want to be sick or you want to be well? For it is written. Here's another thing that amazes me about people. I had a man walk up to me the other day and he said, Now I know you're a preacher. He said, But I got something to talk to you about. I said, What is it? He said, I've been sick now for two years. And he said, my symptoms are not getting any better. And he said, I'm just not really sure about this healing stuff. I said, well, I said, the Bible says in third John, you know, he, everybody's got the Bible in their hand. Now. I said, well, get, get on your phone and turn it to third John verse 2. So he did that. And here's what it said. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper. Did you see that? I wish above all. Turn over and look at it. I want you to look at it with your eyes. Third John, verse two. There ain't but there ain't but one chapter in Third John. Third John, verse. In other words, John just about ran out of stuff to say. He said, "I only got one more chapter left in me." Here it is. But I love that second verse. Watch what he says, beloved. Now let me talk to you about that just a minute. What time is? Oh Lord, what time y'all used to get out here? Y'all just start doing this and I'll shut her down, all right? And what does it say? Beloved. Let me talk to you about that just a minute. What does that mean? Us. Beloved. Who's he talking to? Us. The beloved. How do you get to be a beloved? Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will become a beloved. By the way, am I still confused about this God in control thing? No. Have I cleared that up a little bit? I'm going to keep clearing it up, all right? He said, Beloved, I, I wish above all things. If you're a beloved, this is God's number one wish. Notice he didn't say, I demand. Yes. 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 Notice he didn't say, I give you 24 hours. Yes. Notice he didn't say, I give you six weeks. Boy, it's awful quiet in here. I heard somebody speaking in tongues. It's awful quiet in this Pentecostal church. Notice he didn't say, I'm going to give you 36 hours. He said, I wish 
my number one desire for my beloved is that you prosper. So you need to start having a talk to your checkbook. And you need to start telling your checkbook, you are not operating according to God's wishes for you. I know. What do you mean? I had a lady come up to me recently. She said, do you mean that you actually talk to your checkbook? I said, honey, every time you open yours, yours is talking to you. What did yours say last time you opened it? Amen or oh me? Right? It's an amazing thing that we look at the checkbook and go, oh, me. And the number one wish God has for you is that you prosper. In other words, if God was in control, what's this? What's the next part? Man, y'all don't like me no more, do you? Am I confusing you about this God in control? God is a God of control. God is a God of, he's all powerful. He's almighty, amen? But God doesn't do it the way we want it done. Just go sit at home, let him back the truck up and dump the whole load. Right? Wouldn't that be great if God would do that? How many people have had that happen to you? You just go home and sit and go, beep. You know, when we worked at, when I worked at Yellow Freight, they made us put these warning devices when we got it in reverse that it would go beep, beep, beep. There's so many Christians right now waiting on their castle, wanting to hear the beep, beep, beep. <laughs> well, I know that's God back in the truck up and going to dump the whole load here. <laughs> Amen. We sit on our castle, all right, Lord, drop it down. <laughs> go ahead, Lord, throw the dog a bone. Come on now. I don't care if there's no meat on it. Just throw me a bone. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? But here's what he said. I wish above all things that you prosper. And then it even gets better. And be in health. Sickness and disease is not God's plan for us. Getting old is God's plan for us. We don't have to die sick. We just got to die old. Amen? I mean, I don't like getting old. Getting old's got some things in it I don't like. I tell people, don't be, just be glad you're old. You may not be able to jump over a four rail fence no more. That's what they make ladders for. Right? You may not even be able to see that four rail fence no more. But it's there. But you don't have to die sick. Your body just wears out. With long life will he satisfy you and show you his salvation. You need to get up every morning. You need to say, I'm going to live long. I tell my wife, you stuck with me for a long time. I paid Social Security all my life. I'm going to break the bank. Glory to God. They're going to send me a letter and say, will you please die? We can't afford you no more. (laughs) Amen. Because God's number one wish for me is that I prosper and be in health. Glory to God. So I'm going to go along with his wishes. I say, thank you for health, Lord. I get up every morning, first thing I say, I thank you, Lord, for health in my body. Glory to God. If there's anything in my body that ought not be there, you're removing it right now. Glory to God. Amen? Amen. At noontime, I say, Heavenly Father, it's medicine time again. I thank you for health in my body. Glory to God. And I do it at nighttime before I go to bed. Well, if God's in control, I ought not have to do that. But when I do that, guess what he did? I'm going to take care of my wishes right here. I'm going to make sure you have my wishes in your life right here. Say this with me. I'll never be broke another day in my life. Say this with me. Me and broke don't go together. 
but me and prosperous go together. So money is coming to me right now. First thing you're going to say, well now, how's he going to do that? Not my department. That's above my pay grade. (laughs) Amen? Amen. But he said I was supposed to prosper. How many people know the money's not up there? If he rained it out of heaven, it'd be counterfeit. (laughs) Right? Where's the money? Down here. It's about time for y'all to get a raise at your job. It's about time for y'all to be getting promotions at your job. It's about time for better paying jobs to come into your life. You ought to go to the human resource. You ought to say, I should have this job. And when they say, why? Because my God wishes above all things that I prosper. And tell them, and if you don't hire me, I'm going down the street to your competitor and we will put you out of business and you will be working for me. (laughs) I'll guarantee you one thing, when you leave, they're going to be talking about you. (laughs) Amen? Amen? Now see, you get over into hyper faith here. This is where I get removed from churches. Because pastors get real upset with you when you start talking to them. See, most pastors say this. Well, I've learned about being in ministry. You just have to learn to live with nothing. I say, come here, let me cast that spirit of stupid out of you. (laughs) Amen? Most churches pray this way. Oh, Lord, you keep our pastor humble. We'll keep him poor. They ought to have a real job. They don't work but two days a week. We're going to pay them part-time pay. Well, let me get off of that. Here we go. Amen. We've had pastors tell us, well, we just just resigned ourselves to the fact that we're going to have to live with nothing. I think it's amazing when the Bible says that your pastor ought to have double honor. Isn't that amazing? And the Bible doesn't say that means he's supposed to make a million. That means he's supposed to make an ample wage. Yes. I, had a, I had a church uh, tell me one time, well, we pay him $150 a week. What else does he want? I said, well, he might want to keep his lights on. Because I don't know about your house, but around my house, $150 don't even buy our groceries. Because we eat at our house. Look at me. We eat at our house. Right? Every day we get up, they go, jeet yet? Jeet yet? That's all we talk about on jeet yet? $150 in Kroger, that don't help that. <laughs> you better get you some bologna. Huh? Round steak. Dear old bologna. You better know how to fry it. So if you don't like it the same way all the time, you can kind of mix it up. Huh? You can't have no bread now. You have to eat that on crackers. Because God's in control. Well, well. Where's them first time visitors at? Don't you raise your hand. I know, they're gone. I know it. Here's what I'm telling you. Now, I know this prosperity message has gone way over here. Everybody's not going to drive a Mercedes. Everybody's not going to live in a half a million dollar home. Everybody's not going to have a Rolex. I got an Elgin. I wanted one of them that takes a licking, keeps on ticking. But I'm in the ministry and I couldn't afford it. I know it's not. It's a lie. I'm just cheap. Amen? I'm about done, okay? Have I at least encouraged you a little bit? Now, I'm, and i got to ask you one more question. If there's anybody here you're still confused about this God in control thing, you tell me right now. I'm not leaving until we get on the same page about it. 
Our God is the greatest controller in the universe. In his hand, there's power that cannot be exhausted. But honey, it's an amazing thing what he did in this new covenant. He made it available to us. And if we'll open the door, he'll come in and take over. But he will not take over till you. And here's the amazing thing about God that took me a long time to understand. He has to have permission to take over your life. If he was in control, everybody would already be saved. But when you open up to him and submit yourself to the Lord, just back up because he's going to take over. Amen. Now we're on the same page. All right. Here's what I want you to do. Let him take over. Invite him in. Say, Lord, I can't do this. So it's yours. I submit this to you. Your word says that you wish above all things that I prosper. So there needs to be some prospering going on up in here. Oh, Lord. I forgot where I was. Almost. I almost busted a move right there. Huh? There ought to be some prospering going on up in here. Right? There ought to be some health going on up in here. I told the Lord, I'm not going to let, if you wish it, I'm having it. All right, let's go on. I got to finish this, okay? <laughs> Matthew 12. And then we want to go to <clears throat> Mark, the 10th chapter. We're going to close. Is that all right? Will you give me the 1215? I promise you I'll quit at 1215. Is that all right? We ought to be able to go to church for an hour and 45 minutes, shouldn't we? Okay. I know here's the bad part now. There's going to be some people beat us to the salad bar, and you're going to be mad at me. <laughs> here's what you do. Just go, fire! <laughs> and just walk right on up and get your salad. <laughs> Here we go. Matthew, the 12th chapter. Here we go. I'm going to show you this. What's this? 43rd verse. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest. All right? Then he said, I'll return to my house from whence I came out. And when he's come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. Did you see that? So the devil is just looking for an opportunity to get in. He's looking for a place to rest, to abide. He's looking for a place to operate out of. All right? Isn't that amazing similarity because what's the Holy Spirit doing? The very same thing. He's looking for a place to rest, a place to abide, a place to operate out of. But when we don't do what we should do, when the devil comes, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. When we don't fill up that space with God's Word, with prayer, with associating with God, when we I'm fellowshipping with the Lord, is what I wanted to say. When you do that, when Satan comes, he can't get in. Right? And so it's the same thing. The Holy Spirit is looking for the same opportunity. That's why he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. No different. No different. Satan's knocking. God's knocking. And what we do determines our results. If we're empty, swept, and garnished, he comes in 
And he says, hey, I got plenty more room here. And he goes and gets seven others, and you know our situation gets worse. Have you ever seen people get, that, that kind of got out of the way of the Lord, and all of a sudden their problems began to compound? It just went all the way through their life, all the way through their kid's life, all the way through their job and, th- and their marriage. Have you ever noticed that? Why? Because they were empty, swept, and garnished, and Satan could come in with seven others, and he ruined their lives. So here's what we got to do every day. We've got to, we got to plug up every hole. And we cannot give place to the devil at any time in our lives. Amen? Amen. And I know that that takes a little effort, but it don't take as much effort as you think it does because Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So he'll help you supernaturally get this done so that you can plug every hole up. Here's what people tell me. Well, you do know that sickness is a part of life. No, 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 no. It's a part of the world. Right? There's a difference in the world in your life. Amen? Amen? All right, let's close this, let's close this out. Let me, just, let me just make absolutely sure we're on the same page about God being in control. Turn with me to the 10th chapter of Mark, and that's where, we'll, that's where we'll close. Listen, let me share this with you now. That doesn't mean that we're a bad person. That just means that we've left a gate open. Right? It doesn't mean we're bad people. Good, bad things happen to good people all the time. But I tell people, you can prevent it if you'll plug up every hole and close every gate. All right, let's go. Look right here in Mark 10. Watch this. Let's start in the 46th verse. They came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace, but he cried the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still. Did you see that? It got his attention, didn't it? Well, I'm, I don't want to get there, but I wanted to tell you why. Because people that look at things from the world's perspective identified him from his worldly address. But blind Bartimaeus, who couldn't see, he was blind as a bat, but he saw more than they did. He said, he may live over there in Nazareth, but I know him from his heavenly address. That man don't just live in Nazareth. That's the Messiah. That's the one all you people are looking for, but you won't receive him. That would be the healer. And when he addressed Jesus in the correct way, notice this, Jesus stood still you want to stop him in his tracks just operate in faith you'll get his attention he'll stand still watch this and he said he he, he said bring him up here that's my translation and they called the blind man saying be a good cheer rise he calls you he cast away his garment he knew his begging days was over Because every time Jesus calls you, you ain't going to be no beggar no more. Because you and begging are no more brothers or sisters anymore. You're not a beggar no more. Watch this. He cast away his garment. He came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said this to him. What do you want me to do? Isn't that amazing? Somebody asked Jesus, well, are you blind? Right. <laughs> you know, they had to lead him up there by the hand. He's got that cane, right? And Jesus said, uh, no, what, do you, what do you need me to do for you? Isn't that amazing? In other words, Jesus said, I can't do anything to you until you give me the opportunity. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I remember one time when he walked by and there was a woman that had an issue of blood. But she said, if I just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. 
And Jesus said, who touched me? And the people said, are you kidding me? Everybody is touching you. Everybody testing, but only one got it. I don't want to be in that crowd that don't get it. All right, let's go on. He said, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. What's Jesus? He said to him, well, go on. Your faith made you whole. Glory to God. Glory to God. Notice that Jesus did not lay hands on that brother. He said, go your way. Your faith made you whole. And what does the next word say? Immediately he received his sight. Glory to God. Did God, did Jesus take control? Absolutely he did. How did he do it? He said, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah. You're the deliverer. You're the healer. My 2020 is in you. 2020 just walked by. And he ain't leaving no more. He ain't not getting by me. That 2020 is coming out of you into me. You're going to take control of this, and I'm going to see. And he did. Amen? Here's what I want you to do today. Give him control. Tell him this. What would you have me do for you? Lord, that my finances would get better. Lord, that my marriage would get better. You're the deliverer. You're the one that can do this. Lord, that my children would get off drugs. Lord, that my children would get saved. Lord, that my life would be what your word says it can be. Guess what God does? He just stood still. And you know what happened? When you say, I receive that right now. He just took control. Glory to God. Amen. Say this with me. I'll never be broke another day in my life. I'll never be broke another day in my life. Sickness and disease, Sickness and disease is on its way out, on its way of, out my life of my life right now. Right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Pastor, I'll turn Amen. it over to you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Amen. How many of you are going to go out of here better people today? The word, the word of the Lord changes us, amen? We're going to receive an offering, a love offering for Ken and uh, his, his family before we go. So I want to ask you to prepare for that, ushers, if you guys will come forward. Amen. Good word? Amen. How many of you have lived that word in your life? Two of you. Well, it's a good thing the rest of you showed up today because <laughs> it's going to be life-changing for you. No, I know a lot of you have. Lori and I have. And... Uh, it's the thing about faith, I guess he, he's already shared, but the thing about faith is you need it every time you need it. <laughs> Absolutely. Did you get that? Yeah. And uh, it's not something you just grab a hold of and take a big drink and you never get thirsty again. Right. But when you need God, you need faith at that moment. And the good thing the Bible says is faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You heard the Word of God this morning on faith and God will apply it and cause it to go to work for you immediately if you'll activate it and use what you heard. Amen? All right, I want to challenge you to go out and believe God for something this week. In the meantime, we want to bless the man of God. Uh, he said it about pastors, but it goes about evangelists. It goes about, it, it, it applies to your life. Uh, the Bible says that a workman is worthy of his labor. This man didn't memorize all of that scripture by accident. He spent his life preaching the word, and now it's embedded in his heart and in his mind, and he's able to come in to teach us because of that. Thousands of hours of studying that we don't even get when we're listening to the word of the Lord come forth like that. Thousands of hours. You know what? You know how you get a master's degree or a doctor's degree in the natural world? You study for X number <laughs> hundred hours. Absolutely. They clock your hours. And when you reach a certain amount of hours, you're given a certain degree. In the ministry, we study for thousands of hours and nobody knows it but God. Listen to me tell you, God knows what this man has done. He knows his time that he's put in to study to bring us a word that can change our lives. I want to challenge you today to bless him and to honor him and honor his gift that he brings by giving 
heartily today that they can go out of here with their family's needs being met. So bow your head and let's pray while you, you just contemplate what God would have you to do sacrificially and just from a cheerful heart to be a blessing in their lives. Father, I thank you for the word of faith that is in our mouths, it's in our hearts, and it's ready to be spoken. We learned that word this morning, that you're in control of all things, and you want that control to be imparted into our circumstance. And all we have to do is begin to speak the word of God in relationship to our need, and you take control of that situation, and you write it, and you bring it back into order. Yes. And you bring blessing our way. Amen. And so, Father, we thank you for that word, and we're going to go from here and practice that and put it into practice. But, Lord, we want to bless this family. This man of God and his wife and his, his uh, children are grown, but he still has a mom living with him. We want to be a blessing to help them supply for their needs that they can continue doing what they did for us today. And we thank you for this, this opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you as you have. You know, you ought to be excited about getting to give. Amen. I, I think sometimes we don't get it. The Bible says when you give, you receive. How many of you want to receive this week? Now, the, the plate's already passing, so I'm not trying to pump anybody for money. I want, you to, I want to do what Ken did. I want to help you to get something here. How many of you hope next Friday you get your paycheck? Do you want to receive next weekend or the following week or whenever you get paid? How many of you want to receive? Okay. If you don't receive, what are you going to think about your boss? You're going to hope he doesn't get off after dark for his sake, right? You expect to get paid. Well, guess what? God said, when we give, it shall be given to us, shaken together, pressed down. Will men give into our bosoms?